any church, any family, even by yourself, if you're determined to walk in love, there is a tremendous favor and anointing from God. But if you don't do something with it, you might lose out what you could have. Je Jesus is praying for us here a few hours before he was betrayed. John 17, verse 20. Jesus prayed to the Father, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, that's his disciples, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So that would be us, right? That they may all be, what? One. Even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Now look at all that is in that verse. This says that the world's believing the gospel is contingent upon our being able to get along. And you say, nah. Read it with me that they, you can read out loud with me, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be, one, be in us so that the world may believe. Well, why does our unity cause the world to believe? How can you preach love and a kingdom of life to people and then fight all the time? Do you know that that's why the Church of Jesus Christ has not been more effective in reading, winning, or winning the lost? A message of agape love rings very hollow, hollow when Christians are suing each other in the courts and calling each other names. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that's where we are. I'm just... Okay. When we talk about why... Unity is so important in your family and in the church and what kind of power you get from walking in unity. Now look at verse 23, please. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity. That means like perfect unity. Or please say perfect unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Now, what two things will the world know if we're in unity? Number one, that the Father sent Jesus. And number two, that the Father loves us the way he loves Jesus. Wow. Is that big? It, when does that happen? If we're perfected in unity. Perfect unity causes the world to sit up and take notice because there's nothing like it this side of heaven. You can go to the bars, and you're not going to find that kind of love. All right? You can go to YouTube, and you won't find that kind of love unless they say, you can go everywhere this side is heaven and not find the one thing people were created for. I was thinking today, your body was created for oxygen. And actually, we have less oxygen in the atmosphere than is optimal for us. You can get in a hyperbolic oxygen. What is that called when you have tons of oxygen? You actually feel a chamber, yeah some kind of chamber where they have extra oxygen, you actually feel better and are healthier, okay? Well, that's the way the God made love is to your spirit. We were created for the ridiculous, over-the-top love of heaven. And when people get around it, they always take notice because they've never seen it before. Perfect unity gets the world's attention because we were created to live and thrive in the realm of agape love. Now, love creates unity and selfishness destroys it. The Holy Spirit will not move in an atmosphere of friction because he's breathed there. But he is unstoppable in an atmosphere of the free flow of faith and love. Let's go to Psalm 133. Say this with me. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Now that's in Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll read it in a minute. That was probably Pastor Gordon's favorite, favorite, favorite verse, besides John 10. He liked John 10 a lot, too. You see, we were called to pioneer a church in a town known for fighting churches. Come on. You say, that's not nice. 
And that's what they told us when we came. Churches around here fight not just with each other, but within themselves. They split off. That church is a split from this one, and this is a split from that one, which is a split. Now I can take you down the highway and show the splits. I'm not condemning them, but that's not right. Right. Yeah. And when we went to start a church, do you know what the people were everybody wanted to do? Or not everybody, but a whole bunch of people. <laughs> we wanted to fight. And you say, is that bad, Pastor? It's lethal. Yeah. And that's why Pastor Gordon's favorite verse became, and I'll tell you what, it's, it is absolutely in the bone marrow of our leadership here Hallelujah. because he, he put it there. Be diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And you do that in the church and you also do it in your family. Yeah. And some of you might be in a place where you can't establish the atmosphere of your home, but trust me, when you get your own home and you're the father, you make sure to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Peace, no fucking here. Okay? You say, well, what if I'm not in that kind of atmosphere? Listen, you can walk in love whether anybody else does or not. Look, this psalm is about unity and the benefits of unity. <coughs> Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard coming down upon the edge of his robes. Now, where brothers dwell in unity, there are three blessings. I had actually I haven't read verse three yet, but look at the first two. Verse one. What is the a benefit of unity in verse one? How good and how pleasant it is. When you find a family that's in unity, things are good and pleasant. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. You find a church where unity is good and pleasant. <laughs> Next thing is in verse two. And it says, It is like the precious oil. What is that oil? The anointing. The oil uh, the yeah. anointing flows where there's an exchange of kindness among the saints. When people are good to each other, and I believe we are good to each other, God gets happy and the anointing flows. And the third one is in verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down on the mountains of Zion for there. What happens for there's unity? The Lord commands blessing forever, and nobody can countermand it. When you make... I, I was on the phone with my dad this week, and... Um, my sisters decided, one decided he should drive, and one decided he shouldn't drive. I don't think they know about you, too, but if you do, I love you. <laughs> and my dad said, you know what, Denise, I know you don't like to get involved in family arguments. And I said, oh, you noticed. I'm going to take a side. You know why? Because I'm telling you, fighting families have caused more heartache. Fighting churches have caused more heartache. When you get to heaven, if you love to fight, you're going to go to kindergarten and learn how to not fight. Because <laughs> the Father doesn't like it. Unity brings such power that the devil's only hope where there's unity is to somehow divide and conquer. He cannot do that where the saints of God have a true revelation of Jesus Christ and the power of his love. Let's go to Genesis 11. I know a lot of this is review, but then there's one thing I want you to see at the end. It, do you realize that he said that nothing would be beheld, or would be withheld from the people, the power of Babel, unless he or me? Why? Because they kept saying the same thing. What if we all decided to get something God wanted and kept saying the same thing? Hallelujah. Okay, Genesis 11, 1 to 4. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words, and it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad across the whole face of the earth. Now, we're going to pause here and ask some questions. For whom were they building the city? Themselves. For themselves, that's right. Whose name were they promoting? Themselves. Their own name. Let us make for ourselves a name. Were they trying to reach heaven to find God or compete with God? Competing. They were competing with God, yes. Had they been commanded to scatter, or to not scatter over the whole world? Well, Genesis 1.28 holds the answer to that if you're not familiar with it. Look at what God said in Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and don't scatter over the whole earth. No, fill the whole earth. Could they fill the whole earth if they decided to stay in one spot? Mm -hmm. No. So, they were, were they seeking the purposes of God? 
No. no, they were seeking their purposes. Let's no. keep reading verse 5. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible to them. Question. Did their unity guarantee success unless the Lord intervened? Yes. Would our unity guarantee success if the Lord didn't want to intervene? If, for example, we prayed for something he really wanted. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to give you an example that came to me today. I and mean, the Lord may give us other things to pray together. I'm not trying to get you to pray what I want. This is what I truly believe the Lord wants. I used to pray, you know, drive around this town praying in the Holy Ghost. And I would not be thinking a whole lot. I would just pray it and drive it wherever I was, whoever I was going to visit or whatever. And as, as I'm praying in the Holy Spirit out of the, in English, I would say, Oh, God, let this little town behold your glory. Now you say, maybe it came from your head. I sincerely doubt it. My head was just in neutral. I was vegging, okay? Praying in the Holy Spirit. Oh, God, let this little town behold your glory. And I'm really going to suggest tonight is if you live in King George, say, oh, Father, let King George, Virginia, behold your glory. And we're going to look at what beholding the glory of God does. When you see the glory of God, Christians know God better, and saints can find him because in the presence of the glory of God, enemies bow. Yep. Demonic spirits bow. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's finish off here. Verse 7 and 8. The Lord says, come, let us. Now, what is that? That's a reference to the Trinity. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from the, over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. So what they intended would have happened if the Lord had not stopped them. Let's look at Matthew 18. Just going over the scriptures of unity really fast. Because you see, I think that if you're in strife, it's really hard to get your prayers answered. If you're mad at people, pray on. You might get one, but it is hard when you're mad to get. But when you're at peace with God and at peace with people, you can get your prayers answered. Yeah. When a church is truly in unity, you can get anything you want from God, but unless you decide what you're agreeing on, you, want, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've been given power here. Matthew 18, Jesus is speaking, verse 18. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, that if two of you agree on earth, or they'll say, or if two are in unity, is that right? Mm -hmm. About anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. Where there is unity, prayers get answered, and where there is agreement, our Father does what we ask. Now, when someone calls you and said, would you pray for me? They are asking you to use your influence with God to get them help. This is okay. This is an influence secured through your relationship and walk with the Lord. I believe that this church, you understand, I believe every church in this area can do the same thing. You understand? Mm -hmm. yes. Okay? Yeah. But I can't help them. I'm not called to pastor them. Called them after us. I believe this church has done a number of things right to get into a position of influence with God. Yeah. I mean, why would anybody call me for prayer? Because they think I have some influence with God. Why would they think I have influence with God? Because I walk with God. Why would I call you for prayer? Because you walk with God. Are you following this? Yeah. This church has done two things, I believe, above everything else that would qualify it for influence with God. Number one is we, walk, we love each other. The reason we're hurting like blankety blank is because of Margie. Is so pure to us. Yeah. If somebody has to leave to go in the service or whatever, why does it hurt so bad? Because we love them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, number one, <laughs> we've been in unity. Number two, we have decided that we love God more than money and we love people more than money. Mm -hmm. That is a huge leap of maturity for the body of Christ. Yeah. And you see, I'm gonna, I can demonstrate it. You can demonstrate it. Through your giving, you've demonstrated that. Through the church's giving, the missions, we've demonstrated that. To who we minister to. We don't say, well, who's the fattest cat in town that we can minister to? We say, who needs Jesus? Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Those two things. Go to Ephesians 4. First, we'll look at the unity. Unity. <coughs> 
You know what the Lord spoke to me this afternoon? He said, I have no respecter of persons and I have no respecter of generations. Mm. And what that means is that I can take you through every generation and somewhere or someplace the glory of God has fallen. Some generations more than others. But if he is no respecter of people, and people have asked for the glory of God to fall and gotten it, then he has to hear us if we're many conditions. Mm -hmm. yeah. If he is no respecter of generations, he can't say, well, in 1901, I love the Welsh people enough to visit them with a mighty revival, but I don't love Colonial Beach that much. He is no respecter of persons, and he is no respecter <coughs> of generations. And I'm here to point out two things to you tonight. We have met the qualifications to have power in prayer. And if we decide that we will ask to see the glory of God, we'll see it. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Ephesians 4, 1 to 2. This was scripture I was telling you about was Gordon's favorite passage. Paul speaking, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, Showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Look at verse 2. How do powerful Christians walk? How do mature Christians walk? They walk with all humility and with gentleness. They show forbearance, the first numerical standard said tolerance to one another in love. Mature Christians don't get hot and bothered at the drop of a hat. Okay? If you lose your cool really super easy, it means you're still growing. Amen. Maturity means I love the unity of this body of believers more than I love my own feelings on my shoulder. Yeah. Maturity means I am determined that this body of believers will walk in love, and if I can't see your point of view at the moment, I'm willing to sit down and talk to you. And yeah. That is love. Yeah. To be dil And then look at verse 3. The other thing that mature... Christians do is they're diligent to preserve the unit of the spirit, the mind of peace. That's what we just talked about. The minute, now, I know it sounds crazy. I'm talking about this when we don't have this going on. But it's just not bad to touch on it once in a while. The minute you realize there's a whispering campaign that's been started among the saints, you shut the devil down now or he will shut you down in about 20 minutes. Okay? Because the power in the kingdom of God comes through the free flow of agape love, through unity. Jealousy, strife, gossip, and contention are weapons of darkness to cut off God's power. And what we're talking about here in the church, and thank God, I, there is nothing in this church that impresses me more than extremes ability to walk in love. There is nothing in this, I'm not saying you're perfect, but for <coughs> teenagers, yeah. there is a total lack of gossip. When Miss Karen says this is a gossip-free zone, Mr. Bill said this is a gossip-free zone, y'all have gotten it better than most groups of teenagers. And God honors that. God really honors that. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. We all want to be used in ministry. Or, you know, used somehow for God. But this is the requirement of maturity in Christ. Look what Paul says here. And I, brethren, 1 Corinthians 3, 1, I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. Oh, that wouldn't be much of a compliment, would it? I go to drink and not solid food for you. We're not able to receive it. Indeed, you're still not able. You're a bunch of babies. Now, what are you saying? Yeah. Now, how does he know that? Look at verse 3. For you are still fleshly. For since there's jealousy and strife among you, you are, are you not fleshly and walking like mere men? Now, what's Paul saying? Jealousy and strife is a set characteristic of immaturity. Okay? He said, mere men lack like jerks, not saints of God. Not sure, I'm not sure not one of us would ever have acted like a jerk. <laughs> but let me tell you what, when we started the church, it's a good thing Gordon was a pastor, not me. <laughs> I just wanted to knock some people's lights out. They were such jerks. <laughs> I had a way of dealing with jerks. I could have told, I couldn't have, I'm not strong enough to fist fight, but boy, I can cut you to pieces. Come over and I'll tell you what you really are. <coughs> you say, have you completely outgrown it? Hey, how many of us are completely Jesus? I'm not Jesus. Mm -hmm. I come a long way from back then, okay? Amen. True mature Amen. saints of God preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace in order to fulfill Jesus' prayer. Now let's go back to John 17. We prayed for, for unity, but then look at why he prayed for unity. We didn't quite finish there. John 17, 22. Thank <laughs> you. 
the glory which you have given me, I have given to them. What is that glory? It's the glory of this Lord. That they may be one, just as we are one, I and them and you and me. That they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Now look at verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so that they may see your glory. My glory, excuse me. Which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. What goes with unity? What accompanies unity? The glory of God. What does Jesus want for us as a church? To see his glory. And like I said, I used to just go around town and this would just pop out of me. Oh, Father, let this poor little town see the glory of God. By poor, I didn't just mean poor financially, but poor in spirit. They don't know the goodness of God. Moses paid the price of friendship with God, and one day when they were alone, you know, he says, let me see your glory. Now, if, if we read this passage, we'll see God let him see. But you know what? He would not have been able to pray that, pray that prayer unless he had paid the price of friendship with God. He was alone on the mountain with God, right? Yeah. Yeah. He would not have seen the glory unless he had asked to see the glory. Right. You want to read the... It's, it's Exodus 33. Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. And he said, you can't see my face, for no man can see my face, can see me and live. So could he see the whole glory that we'll see in heaven? Mm -mm. No, but he did the best he could. Then the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and you still stand there on the rock. And it will come about while my glory is passing by. I will put you in the cleft of the rock, cover you with my hand until I pass by. And then I will take my hand away, and you'll see my back, but my face shall not be seen. He said, If you saw my glory, my face, you'd die, but just see the glory that follows me behind, and you'll, you'll see enough. And my point is this. Now, two things. Moses could not have prayed that prayer if he hadn't been a real close friend of God and alone with God and just said, I want to see your glory. Amen. And so he got to see more glory than any of us have ever seen. Yeah. All right? But if he hadn't asked, there's no indication God would have done that. He, God did that because he asked. God wants us, the cry of our hearts is, Oh, Father, let us see your glory. Let this town behold the glory of who you really are. Hallelujah. Now we don't have a right time to read all these scriptures, but you'll remember that later when Joshua and Caleb gave the good report and said, we need to go in and take the land, they all said, stone them with stones. And they were going to be stoned with stones. Do you know what saved them? The glory of the Lord showed up. Hallelujah. If you go to Numbers 14, verse 6, it says, Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. And then they all said, Stone with stones. Yeah, let's skip down to verse, uh, oh well. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Don't fear them. Now what happens? All the congregation said, Stone with stones. And then the glory of the Lord appeared. Now here's the good news. When the glory of God appears, your enemies are completely powerless. Do you know what David said? You are my glory and the lifter of my head. He said you're my shield. His, the glory of God on David's life made him invincible. The Philistines couldn't kill him. Goliath couldn't kill him. You know, Absalom couldn't kill him. And it was the glory. Yeah. Hallelujah. When the glory of God invades a place, you may see it and you may not see it. Now, Brother Hagin many times saw the glory of God. He would see it come in as a mist. And as it came in, people would go out under the power and he'd step out of the way so he could continue ministering. Many, many times he said, I saw the glory. If we had time, we'd go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel saw the glory of God standing in the plain. Moses prayed, Jesus prayed that he'd see, that we would see his glory. And it should be the cry of our hearts to see his glory. For the Lord is no respecter of persons or of generations. Mm -hmm. One other place, 2 Chronicles 7, 1 to 3. This is when Solomon has prayed a prayer to dedicate the temple. And when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices. And the glory of the Lord filled the house. 
And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord, because the glory of the Lord filled the house. And all the sons of Israel, read this with me out loud. And all the sons of Israel, seeing the fire come down, and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshipped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, Truly he is good. Truly his loving kindness is everlasting. I don't think it's realistic to think that God would answer some people's prayer to see the glory and not others, mm -hmm. if you're his friend. But as a friend, a friend is somebody committed to doing his work. <laughs> I want, here's why I think we're not excited about this. It's because one time I said, how many of you have seen a true move of God? I was astonished. I was astonished. At I see, I've seen moves of God where nobody could have stopped it. Nobody could have stopped it. It was so powerful, just like a tsunami. Just get out of his way if you don't want to get saved, because if you're around, you will get saved. Mm -hmm. I saw it in 1970 at a free Methodist church. I saw it when I met Gordon for one year. Somebody got saved every week. It was just, I want you, I want to read you really fast. I may have read some of these before, but when David Brainerd ministered to the uh, native population in Delaware, um, Roberts Laird, I know we can't, I'm going to read a couple of places. I'm going to pray. And he said, why would you get so excited? Because if we saw his glory, people would see him. Yeah. Yes. There are times when we plant God's word for days, weeks, or even years, and then one day the floodgates burst open and the Spirit of God pours down upon us like a mighty flood. Remember those biblical steps in spreading the gospel. I have planted a pause water, but God gave me increase. David Grainard had been discouraged for a time as he planted and watered among the Native Americans, but God was about to shower him with increase. Preparing his heart to be used to the fullest in ministry, David Brainerd wrote, I long to spend the little inch of time I have in the world more for God. I feel a spirit of seriousness, tenderness, sweetness, and devotion, and wish to spend the whole night in prayer and communion with God. On August 6th, preaching to the Crossweekson natives, David spoke on the love of God from 1 John 3.16. There were more than 50 Indians in the room. Nearly all of them were in tears or lying prostrate, crying out in distress that they had not accepted Christ's love before this. They were brought to their knees by the Holy Spirit's power at work within their souls. When he asked them, what would you like God to do for you, their clear answer was, we want Christ to wipe our hearts completely clean. Two days later, on August 8, 1745, the Holy Spirit swept through Crocs weeks and an answer to David Brainerd's fervent prayers. Sixty-five Native Americans filed into the house where Brainerd was preaching that afternoon. He spoke from Luke 14, 23, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. David Brainerd preached that night under a mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit. After the message, he walked around the room praying individually for men and women who lay prostrate under conviction. When suddenly, the power of God seemed to descend upon the assembly as of a rushing mighty wind. And it was an astonishing energy that bore down all before it. I stood amazed, he marveled, and could, do, co and could compare it to nothing more aptly than the irresistible force of a mighty torrent or a swelling deluge when, it is, when its unsupportable weight and pressure that bears down and sweeps before whatever is in the way. Throughout the house, natives were praying and crying out for mercy. The ones who had already received their salvation were rejoicing in Christ and praying for their distressed friends, sharing the good news of Jesus' sacrificial love, and inviting them to give their hearts to him. I don't know how much time we want to spend on this. In, in Hawaii, they saw a tremendous move of God. And you say, why would we want to know about this? Because we have to understand, God is no respecter of people, and he's no respecter of generations. Mm -hmm. I believe that if, we could, if they could see a move of God like that, that we could see it. And I think it's the only thing that will help the American people who are so proud and so dense to spiritual things. Yeah. In the 1820s in Hawaii, by the end of 1820s, the church grew such that the missionaries had to preach outdoors, at times to crowds of 10,000 natives. There were six large churches in the islands with 12,000 in each one. There were 26,000 students in the schools, 440 Hawaii teachers. Bingham wrote home to the American board, your hearts would leap for joy and you would give thanks forever to God for ever putting it into the hearts of any to cross the wide waters to preach salvation to this people. They had they had to build churches that of, of, of over a thousand to have four services a day. One day they said four let me see if I can find it here. 
Bingham was truly blessed by this revival. He said, indeed, there was a shaking among the dry bones throughout the nation. The Spirit of God most manifestly hovered over the islands. The gospel proved to be the power of God and the wisdom of God for the recovery of the lost. Our ears were allowed to hear and our eyes to see the glorious things in our Hawaiian Zion. Thousands of the liberated appeared to be coming to Zion and celebrating the praises of the deliverer. This gracious visitation of the Spirit of God from on high led to unusual thousands to crowd the doors of the sanctuaries, where they were addressed with unusual earnestness and where the united cry of many ascended to heaven. Over 7,000 people were added to the Hawaiian churches in a matter of a few months, 600 of them children and teenagers, and the revival lasted for seven years. I can take you to Greenland, where the Moravian, and if it happened there, and every single time it happened on the, on the wings of fervent prayer, yeah. And, and I'm just saying, uh, if, if we were a fighting bunch of people, I wouldn't even get it a shot, I think. Uh -huh. He's going to pass right by us. He's not going to move among a bunch of fighters. But we're not. Uh -huh. And the thing is, we have paid the price to see the move of God. And there's another passage in Luke 16. It's one of my favorite ones where it said, it says, if you haven't done what's right with unrighteous man, then who will trust true riches to you? In other words, if you can't pass the money test, when is God ever going to really give authority and anointing and power to your life if you won't ask the money test? So you see, if we weren't givers, then I wouldn't think we had much of a shot at the move of God. But those two huge tests of people who love God more than money and love people more than money and who walk in love, that's, that's all it takes to cry out for God. And I've just committed myself today. I am going to cry out to see your glory until this little town sees your glory. And we have 10 minutes to pray. Are there other urgent prayer requests before we pray? I know we had to pray for Margie Sherman. Let's pray. Just say, God, let us see your glory. Don't pass us by. Yeah. You know, <coughs> who is there? Could you play something, Nathan? Let's pray for 10 minutes. And uh, <coughs> Normally I don't tell people what to pray, but you know what I got today is those people at, at the Tower of Babel were seeing exactly the same thing, and nothing could stop them. Uh, how many of you could agree, let us see your glory would be something you'd be okay. Let's pray until we see it.